Okay, so um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I will offend almost everybody in the room, and I won't back down. And uh, I can't help it. I'm just going to do that. And the other sad thing I'm going to say to you is um, you're not the most important thing in the world and when it comes to energy. Okay? Uh, and no matter what I do anyways, you're not going to adopt it because you're stuck with this thing. See this thing right there? And you're going to keep holding on to it. Remember, it's really not good. And now they've all proven it because I come from MIT and I work a lot with DOE. And they're all, they all want to do the smart grid. So what's that infer if they want to do the smart grid? You've lived with something dumb for 100 years now. They, they even admit it by saying it. And so um, you can see my EE department loves me at MIT too, can't you? <laughs> so um, because you have that, you've invested a lot of money in it. So it would be actually dumb of you to give up. But um, it's probably not the way to go. And the people who are going to be driving the energy argument are too poor to afford it anyways, thank God. So they won't duplicate it. And so today's lecture is really about them. All right? I, I wish I could say something profound about you and how you're going to live, except that there's a person I work with. I'll show him at the very end of the talk. And he, we, a lot of people now write that we're trying to help the poor, but really the poor are going to help you, okay? Because they'll end up teaching you how to live a future energy while you keep holding to your death grip onto your past energy system, okay? That's just a preamble to prove to you that I will offend and get you angry at me by the end of this talk. Okay, so what did I mean by all that? It turns out you use, I don't want to go give an energy, a uh, global energy talk. I'll just give you a few numbers. You use 14 terawatts of power. It's a big light bulb. You're burning a 14 trillion watt light bulb. And you need to give energy to burn the light bulb. So you're using mostly coal, oil, and gas. In 2050, so I wrote a paper in 2006 in PNAS. And I said that you're going to need 16 terawatts more by 2050. And you can go read how to do that calculation. And a lot of people then say, oh, well, we need to conserve, conserve, conserve. What people forget, they never read the footnotes, is I assume that you would save every bit of energy you use today. So my assumption was you were going to have great science and technology advances and you would save 14 terawatts of energy by 2050, and you're still going to need 16 terawatts. And that's why this story isn't about you. Actually, you're doing a good job of it. You're trying hard now to save energy for different reasons, mostly economic and energy security. So if you're the ones doing the good job of saving all this energy, why do you need 16 terawatts more? And it's because it comes from 6 billion new energy users. So there's 3 billion people who don't use any energy or only small amounts of energy. And there'll be 3 billion new people showing up minimally. So there's 6 billion new energy users coming up. And if I assign them some amount of energy by 2050 in a thoughtful way, you come up with 16 terawatts of energy effectively. So it's, it's really, and these are people I call non-legacy, not poor. It turns out some, a lot of these people you would consider poor, but they're non-legacy. They haven't inherited an energy system. They have no legacy of energy. So that's why they can be early adopters, because it's a lot easier for them than it would be for us. All right, so that's who's driving the energy problem. And so then if you say, those are the people driving the energy problem, and I worry about energy and greenhouse gases and climate change, it was, just seemed obvious to us that we should be actually trying to do something for them. And I hate to say it, we all really care about the poor in our hearts, but in our actions we don't, right? Because they're over there, they're poor, they don't affect our lives. But they're going to start affecting your lives if you don't start taking care of them right now. So it's to your benefit uh, to make this argument to the Department of Energy is almost impossible. 
because they have their own problems, right? It's the United, as Sam Bodman once said to me, Dan, when I was Secretary of Energy, I was Secretary of Energy for the United States of America, right? So there's the dichotomy. We have the power to do something for them, poor, but that's not what we get paid to do. So there's a whole bunch of problems with trying to address this, but this is where what academics does in schools uh, can actually come to bear and actually do a good job because they have, they're a little bit unfettered. You don't have as much baggage to, to uh, carry. Now the problem with non-legacy people is they don't have a lot of money. That's why they don't have a big energy system. And if they don't have a lot of energy, uh, money, that means you've got to build things for them where cost is the most important thing, not efficiency. Right? So having a highly efficient system at some point helps reduce cost, but then we always go way too far. When you go to really high efficiency systems, you get really pricey. Right? So today I'm going to talk about it in a totally different way. Every day we got up, we said it had to be cheap, and I don't care at all about efficiency. Then I'll start worrying about efficiency. And that makes you design your science in a different way. And the beauty of this is this whole argument is you're needed still. You're needed because you can't take things that you're using now and just make them smaller because cost doesn't scale that way. If you have something that's expensive and highly efficient, it's expensive. As you start scaling it down, it's efficient because you have a lot of engineering and balance of systems cost. So as you begin scaling down, the system might get smaller. You would think it's going to get less expensive, but you still need all those balance of systems. They keep scaling. And finally, what you find out is that this doesn't scale linearly. The balance of systems costs don't go away as you get tinier because you still need them. So that's a good thing for most of the people in this room because if you attack this problem, you actually have to start from ground zero, blank piece of paper, and say, I'm going to invent from the ground up, and the ground up invention is only going to be for poor people or non-legacy people. Now, when I made this argument, what I just did is I said, There'll be six billion new people. I assign them some amount of energy in a smart way, and I come up with 16 terawatts. I do multiplication. You're a person. You use this much energy. There's going to be 9.2 billion of you. You'll need that much energy. I wished I was the first to do this, but I wasn't. I was predated by over 100 years, because in 1898, delegates from across the world gathered in New York City to talk about urban planning, code word, civil engineering, but they didn't talk about housing, land use, economic development, or infrastructure. They talked about horse manure. See, the delegates were driven to desperation by horse manure. This is all true. So what they did is, I'm gonna now make my energy argument with horses. Here are rich people, they own horses. I can measure how much manure comes out of the back of a horse. Here are poorer people. They don't own horses. But by 1930, the economy will be growing. And then they're all going to own horses. And so now, just like I assigned energy per person, they assigned the amount of horse manure per person. And when you did the calculation, the Times of London estimated that every street in London would be buried nine feet deep in horse manure. <laughs> and in New York City, horse manure would rise to the third story window of every building. And that's a real calculation. They did exactly what I did for energy. Now, that, is, that was really traumatic to people at the time. And what they didn't see, right, was the automobile coming. Once the automobile showed up, this problem went away. Even more striking, the internal combustion engine was already invented in 1898, but people didn't even realize that that thing would solve the problem. And that's what, for the young students, that's what you're supposed to do in science. You're supposed to have what's called a paradigm shift. Because when you have a paradigm shift, so horses, when the automobile showed up, it was a paradigm shift. People couldn't even do analyses. They didn't even think about it. But once that showed up, this whole problem went away. Right? So as scientists, 
That's what you're supposed to do. What this just proves to you is that shift happens. <laughs> I worked hard for that one. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to tell you about a little shift happening in my group, okay? So solar is, uh, doesn't penetrate markets. It doesn't penetrate markets because you pay four cents per kilowatt hour. You use coal. You're never going to be cheaper than coal ever, 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 because you've spent around 100 years of money to make coal inexpensive. You've already paid for it effectively. You've built the infrastructure. So that's one reason why solar has trouble penetrating a market. The other reason, which I can't help that much, you know, that's a policy decision. So I wish we could price carbon, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen in the United States. So then you have to take a different approach. And so I'm going to go for the approach for solar of jealousy, all right? And I really mean it. If I do something really good for poor people, then I'm hoping everybody here will get so ticked off that they'll want to live like them. And I have great faith in jealousy when it comes to America, okay? And, but I still have a problem even with that is renewables, of course, aren't there all the time. If you're going to do solar, which I'm a fan of, it's not there at night. And so you really have to do storage. And so that's the problem we attack. Lots of people are doing photovoltaics. Not that many people are really focused on storage in the way you need to be for poor people. Now, what do I mean by that? So you can go read this paper in Chemer Reviews we wrote in 2010, end of December. But I went through all the ways you can store energy. Right? And what I'm highlighting here is how much energy you can store per weight of something. That's megajoules per kilogram. And so here's one thing you could do. You could compress air. The solar panel is getting light. That's generating electricity. I then run a compressor during the day. I compress air underground. And then at night, I just run the compressor effectively backwards. That's a turbine. I generate electricity. And that's called compressed air energy storage. And that's around 0.5 megajoules per kilogram. I could pump water, hydroelectric. That's actually how the biggest way we store renewable energy. But that, in terms of energy density, is really lousy. You need to go 0.001 megajoules per kilogram. That's easy. It's mass times the gravitational constant times height, mgh. Right? That's the potential energy. Capacitors, lousy. Batteries, lousy, Can't, I hate to say it. Now, batteries are really important if you're moving a car around 100 kilometers, but I need to store 16 terawatts of energy, okay? And you're not gonna make batteries store much more energy because you gotta put an electron here, 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 and when you take the physical density of matter, the only way I can really increase the energy energy density of a battery is if I compress it, but I don't let it weigh more. Right? Think about it. Metal air batteries are a great hope. They are. They'll be around a factor of four over lithium batteries. You got a, a, a lot of the companies you read, they forget to mention that you got to put the metal oxide because when the oxygen reacts with the metal, there's actually weight there. That's tremendous. Because if you have to go 100 kilometers and you can go to 400 kilometers driving, that's a big deal. But my contention is because of that low energy density, you still won't choose it. And the reason you won't choose it, I'm sure of it, is not because of any scientific argument, but you did the experiment. At the turn of the century, you could have chose batteries. They were already here. By the way, not that much different in energy density than they are today. You could have chosen capacitors, and you chose fuels because you knew that fuels had the highest amount of energy density. And so it's 100 to 1,000 times more. And that's actually a nice thing to do. You can use freshman chemistry or physics. Remember, I said you're storing it in electrons. So if I have an electron here, and I have an electron here, and I turn my finger upside down, and I pair the electrons and put them in the smallest volume, guess what that is? a bond, and take the volume of a bond versus the volume of a lattice, it really works out. 
Isn't that nice and simple? So fuels are always been the champs. Now, the next thing you should do, especially for the students, I come from MIT. If you had any person from any academic institution, all we're trying to do is get money to fund our research. So I just chose a unit to make my argument look really, really good. And so the first thing you can always do, I'm going to teach you something, if you're under 25, always go for the unit. And then you'll con totally confuse the speaker. Okay? So I have to prove to you, why do I even care about energy density? I could have chosen a different unit and re-ranked ordered these. And I care about energy density because I told you I need to help poor people. So how's that all related? So here's my research project. I, I don't do research projects. I don't do research anymore. I sit at my desk and I make Google plots. I go on Google and I make plots. And then I run into the, my lab and I tell my students, look what I just discovered. And they're actually doing real work. And they tell me to shut up and go back to my office. And I do. So the only way I get to tell people about my research is when I give talks like this. So here's my latest research discovery. What I did is I went on the web and I said, how much did a Boeing 777 weigh? So I took the weight. How much did it cost to make? Cost per unit weight. And then I said, how many did you make a year? And they made 74 in 2006. Then I did that for etching tools, machine tools, and automobiles. Look, I have a curve. That means I, that's good for a scientist, because now I can predict, if I know the weight of something, I can actually start to predict how much it's going to cost to make. There's some interesting things on this. The first thing is you never get below $10 per pound, ever. It really works. I don't care what the sophistication of the thing you think you're building, you'll never get lower than $10 per pound. The man who just built the largest oil refinery in the world, Mr. Ambani in Italy, or in India, he owns Reliance. He spent a whole, you, if you build an oil plant, you want to know how much it's going to cost because you need to get the capital expenditure and set up a business model to get the money back to pay for it and make a profit. And so you hire lots of ec ec economists at great cost. And I just told Mr. Mbani when I was reading, just give me the weight of everything, concrete, wire, everything. He did. I multiplied by 10, and I nailed his CapEx cost. That really depressed him. OK? So I'm going to tell you to go do that. What you shouldn't do this for is pharma. Don't do it for pills. Don't do it for commodity chemicals. Don't do it for Intel chips. But that's not how you build energy systems. You build energy systems like machines. That's what this is about. And it really works. You could say an automobile and Boeing 77 aren't that different, Dan, but that is. So I did call McDonald's, and you can call them too. And I found out the price of the hamburger, meat, the tomato, the lettuce, and the roll. It comes out to $10 per pound. All right? And now you can figure out how much of a profit they're making. Two fifty dollars a hamburger, and they're selling it for around four fifty dollars or sixty. dollars okay? And so this is really the key for the poor. And this graph tells you why you can't help the poor the way you live. Because what do you guys do? You build one big thing, one thing. You centralize it. Even if it's at $10 per pound, it's really heavy. right? And you do what I just said you do all the time. You build a big plant. You're rich enough that I can then set up a cost structure where I can recover my money, that's called return on investment, pay off the capital expenditure, and make a profit. But now you see why this isn't going to work for poor people. They don't have enough money to take care of your capital expenditure. So that's why I'm, I have no doubts and no fears that anybody's going to help the poor anytime soon by building lots of big plants everywhere, because they don't have the money to pay for it. If you look at this graph, then, it says you should be working at this end of the graph for poor people. What you, should, you hear a lot of this. This is the only new thing I'm going to throw in here. You're going to hear a lot of times, oh, high throughput manufacturing. People say that all the time. Yeah, high throughput manufacturing, but it's got to be really lightweight because of the $10 per pound. So if you can make lightweight energy system, with high throughput manufacturing, you should be able to go to the poor. The other neat thing about this, I like it from a science point of view, 
is this, this is always scale up. You do something in your lab, you gotta scale it up. Look at what you do here. You do something really well. Hey, by the way, look at what just happened. Everybody who thinks batteries are gonna save the world, could you just get me one that lasts my damn lecture? Okay, please, let's just start small. Play V. I think I, oh, forget it. I'll just let it rest, it will come back over time. So what you really wanna do then is you wanna go to scale, you make something lightweight that's highly manufacturable, the way you go to scale is by making it a lot, right? That's called manufacturing. We forgot about that in America too, because only around 50 miles from here they thought they could make money by trading paper a lot, right? That didn't work out so well. Okay, so I'm gonna, I, I, I'm, by the way, I'm a terrible conservative. You would never notice that, realize this, because I wanna go back to what used to work for America, which is called manufacturing. Okay, that's number, like we're gonna create stuff and make it and then manufacture it, woo. Okay, and then the other reason why I'm a throwback is because of here. The other reason why I'm convinced you won't get away from fuels is that's what nature has done. So what does nature do? Nature had the opportunity to make batteries or capacitors. It has membranes, but it also decided to store energy and rearrange chemical bonds. And if you think about it, the way the earth works is solar energy comes in, you do photosynthesis, you eat the photosynthesis, you release the energy inside you. That's worked for two billion years. And now you've done a 150 year experiment and it's not working out so well. So I am by far the most conservative voice, I tell this on the Hill all the time in energy, because I just want to go back to what's worked for two billion years. How much more reactionary can you get, right? So I would like to go back to just doing what nature does, which is called photosynthesis. And here's the only thing I want to, there's only two things I want to say about photosynthesis. First is energy balance. You might remember from school, if you didn't take, if you're not a biologist, sunlight comes in, you give it water, you give it CO2, the plant, it makes oxygen, and it makes the carbohydrate, sugar. What <clears throat> nobody probably ever told you in high school is all the solar energy is stored simply in water splitting. So if I look at the energy per unit electron, normalize it for the number of electrons, which you should do, because if I just want four electrons in this reaction, I just increase the amount by amount of water effectively, and I can get the same equivalency of electrons for the bottom reaction. The bottom reaction is taking sugar and burning it with O2 to get CO2 and water, and this is how much energy you get out, 1.24 electron volts, 1.24 units of energy. If I take hydrogen and oxygen and get to water, it's 1.23. And in this reaction, you're splitting water to oxygen and hydrogen, and the hydrogen is getting fixed with CO2 to make sugar. So water splitting subsumed in this reaction, and you can see you're only getting 0.01 more units of energy out of making the sugar. It has, so the whole Calvin cycle in photosynthesis has nothing to do with energy storage. It has to only do with hydrogen storage. Okay, all the energy storage is up front in just the taking sunlight, rearranging the bonds of water to hydrogen and oxygen. There you've stored all your solar energy. All the rest of the stuff the plant's doing is it couldn't deal with the hydrogen gas, so it needed a solid form of hydrogen storage. And it also needed to stand up. It had a whole bunch of living requirements. All right, so if I'm gonna try to redo photosynthesis from a solar energy point of view, and I only have 40 years, I'm gonna just stop here with water splitting and I'm gonna to have to deal with hydrogen. The caveat is I would love somebody to go the full distance and get me a hydrogen storage mechanism. But as I'll explain in a few minutes, I can't wait, right? Because we only have 40 years right now. Now, how much water, why did plants choose water? And I'm just gonna give this quickly. I can tell you it's 237 kilojoules per mole of water. If I take a liter, it's 13 megajoules. I take the swimming pool of MIT. Now here's the, I needed 16 terawatts of energy. If I take that swimming pool, if I make an energy system where I distribute it all over the world, everybody has their own little energy system, they have the equivalent of one pool of water, and now sunlight's coming in, 
And per second, so per second, I'm splitting one pool of water globally to hydrogen and oxygen. I'm not going to need another pool because after I've made the H2 and O2, you recombine H2 and O2, get the energy out, and you get water back. It's a closed system. Now, I'm going to need more than a pool of water because I've got to distribute it everywhere. But the thought experiment, let's just do the thought experiment. I take a pool of water to hydrogen and oxygen per second using sunlight. What's the power you get out of that? You can do the calculation at home, 43 terawatts. I only need 16. I need one-third a pool of water, all right? Now, that's at 100% efficiency. Nothing's 100% efficient. The lousiest energy systems are 30% efficient. So I need a pool of water to get 16 terawatts. That's it, right? So this is why this train is coming down the track, whether you like it or not. I don't need to worry about climate change and global warming because photosynthesis figured it out already. There's a huge amount of energy density you can store in water by just rearranging the bonds with the sun, okay? The question is, are we gonna get there fast enough? That's a different question. Okay, so I want to redo photosynthesis and do a pool equivalent of water. I'll just tell you, people have been trying to do photosynthesis for a long time. Uh, this is a quote from 1912. Chimichan said, if our black and nervous civilization, he meant based on coal oil, shall be followed by a quieter one on solar energy, that wouldn't be harmful. And then what he said, what you have to do is master the photochemical processes that have been the guarded secret of plants by making new compounds. It's really neat, because all we did is read that, and we said, okay, we'll try to do everything he said in 1912, okay? Now, he was a scientist, the first real photochemist, in case you don't know, he was an Italian scientist in Bologna. He would only, he would only put compounds in Erlen Myers go to the roof of a building at the University of Bologna. If he saw things change with sunlight, he would study them in his lab. If they didn't, he would just throw the stuff down the drain. So he was the real first photochemist. Um, and in 1912, he had that insight. But in 1938, which wasn't very far away, Jimmy Stewart even figured it out. I bet you guys don't know that. Now, Jimmy Stewart, there's a lot of young people, you won't even know who he is. He was an actor who mumbles, and you can hardly understand what the hell he's saying, so listen carefully, okay? So in 1938, in this movie, you can't take it with you. Here's Jimmy. Now, he makes a number of mistakes. You can see this is an old movie, because he's trying to win over this woman for a date, and first thing he does is he admits he's a scientist, okay? That's bad. <laughs> but I want you to listen to what Jimmy said about the solar energy problem. I remember in college, another guy and I had an idea to... Mind if I talk about myself? If you don't, I will. Well, this guy and I had this idea. We... We wanted to find out what made the grass grow green. Now, that sounds silly and everything, but it's the biggest research problem in the world today, and I'll tell you why. Because there's a tiny little engine in the green of this grass and in the green of the trees that has the mysterious gift of being able to take energy from the rays of the sun and store it up. You see, that's how the heat and power in coal and oil and wood is stored up. Well... We thought if, if we could find the secret of all those millions of little engines in this green stuff, we could, we could make big ones. And then we could take all the power we could ever need right from the sun's rays, you see? Well, that's wonderful. I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. We worked on it and worked. And, you know, day and night, we got so excited we forgot to sleep. If we make just one little discovery, we we'll walk on air for days. Yeah. And, and what? Well, then we left school. 
Now he's selling automobiles. I'm in some strange thing called banking. I remember in college. In case you didn't hear what he said. He said I I, he couldn't do it, so he left school and his friend selling automobiles. He's in a strange thing called banking, which is, describes all the failed scientists at MIT. They all became bankers, and they came up with this thing called derivatives, and look where that got you. <laughs> okay, so uh, how does photosynthesis work? Sunlight comes in. I'm going to treat this as a systems engineering problem. I don't want to get into all the details of this. Sunlight comes in. Plant can't get its hand around sunlight. So the first thing it does is it, it, when the sunlight comes in, it, it separates charge inside the leaf, and it makes an electron and a hole, an exciton, so that you have the positive charge and negative charge. And then that charge moves to each end of the membrane. So when you have a moving charge, you have a current. It's just like in the wall, but it's wireless, so there's no wires. Sunlight in, it gets converted immediately to a wireless current an energetic wireless current. Now, the plant only does it one electron and one hole at a time. The problem is when you do water splitting, because I told you the plant puts all the solar energy in the rearranged bonds of water, water is a four proton, and that says four electron. So you need four units of charge. Sunlight's coming in is only giving you one unit of charge. You could say, why didn't the plan evolve to use one photon to get all four units of charge at once? If you look at the energetics of water splitting, that puts you up in the UV where the sun doesn't shine. So it had this problem of taking in visible light, making a unit charge, but then it had to do it four times. So it was compulsory that it stored two catalysts at the end of the charge separating network to collect the charge one at a time. Once it got to four, this catalyst called the oxygen evolving complex splits water to oxygen. It leaves four protons behind. The four protons behind come over here. There were the four electrons that were left over, and that makes hydrogen. So that's how the plant works from a systems engineering point of view. And all this stuff is just details of how to make the wireless current and how to store it. But it's sunlight in one electron hole at a time, times four, put it in a catalyst, and then split water. Okay, so that's how the plant works. We're gonna go one step further. We're not just gonna do artificial photosynthesis, we're actually gonna try to build a device that does artificial photosynthesis, which is a leaf. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna now lead up to, and I'm actually, Marshall Newton always says, it's Marshall, I'm now 30 minutes into my talk, I'm about to actually show data. I don't know where he is, but he's going to be very excited right now. So this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to bring a photon in, but I'm going to use silicon. I'm going to give you the thought experiment up front. Can I separate the charge, one hole and electron at a time, put two catalysts at the very end, just like the end of the membrane of photosynthesis, and then collect the four holes, split water, make O2, and then take the electrons on the other side and make hydrogen. And I want to do this with no wires. Wires start adding to balance of systems. It starts adding to weight. So I want to keep weight out of this at all costs, because it is costly. So this guy, I don't want to go into why we did this, uh, but this guy he was a postdoc in my group. All he did is he took cobalt, a metal ion, and phosphate, put it in solution. And when you take cobalt 2 plus and oxidize it to 3 plus, you see a thin film form. You can do it at this potential, just at the knee of the cobalt 2-3 couple. Or you could come deep into this wave. That wave means something's happening catalytically. What's happening catalytically is you're splitting water to oxygen. So those are real bubbles. It's not sped up. And you're making O2. The protons are coming over here. You can't see to make hydrogen. I'll get to that in a minute. What happened is, to get that going, you made this thin film on the surface. It just self-assembles. Okay, so what is the thin film that self-assembled? First off is why do I even care? Because in high school or grade school, you maybe had a teacher who put two platinum electrodes in water, right, and put a battery on it. She or he could have put a photovoltaic. And it's because she was using platinum 
or he was using platinum. And the problem with platinum, it does hydrogen well, but it does oxygen in a lousy way. So what the teacher had to do for you to see a lot of bubbles is she or he had to keep turning up the voltage. And you can see as if, if it takes longer to do the reaction by getting over this barrier. By turning up the voltage, I can make the barrier tinier and it can run faster. Well, for this catalyst I just showed you, for any metric, at any potential that I turn the voltage up past the thermodynamic potential, the over potential, for any voltage I'm at for platinum, this cobalt catalyst is a thousand times better. So that's the first thing. Secondly, it's cobalt and phosphate. It's not platinum. It's cheaper. What is it? You can take this thing as it's running. So what we do is we take mylar, we sputter ITO on it, we put it in a synchrotron, we get the catalyst going, and then we come in and we do XAPS, and we actually use the light source here, and we do PDF, pair we do uh, pair distribution functions. And what you find is that that catalyst isn't a solid state material. Solid state materials tend to show long range scattering because of next nearest neighbor effects. Everything looks molecular. And what it is, is it is a molecule. So this cobalt gets oxidized from cobalt two to three, and it self assembles into this disk of seven cobalts. I'm not showing you, but the, two pho the phosphate that's in there is capping the end because cobalt likes to be octahedral six ligands around it, so the phosphate caps it. So that's what, that's what you find out the structure of this thing is that's self-assembled, it's a molecule. So there it is. This is the oxygen evolving complex. I'm just showing you the stick figure that's in photosystem two in the plant. That doesn't look anything like that. This has a cube, a cube of manganese, and then it has a calcium here and another manganese hanging off of it. Okay, so that's what the oxygen evolving complex is. Five years ago, Jimmy Stewart said if we could make compounds that were the guarded secret of plants, this discovery really was pr propagated by Jim Barber at Berkeley, who got the crystal structure in 2005 of the plant, the photosynthetic membrane, and all of a sudden it wasn't a guarded secret anymore. We knew exactly that the oxygen evolving complex looked like that. Now what I'm going to do, though, is take out manganese, add cobalt, so watch, and then I'm going to do a head-to-tail dimerization. So I'm going to take this cube, and then I'm going to head-to-tail dimerize it. So you get that, right? So there's the manganese. I'm just going to flip it over, take two of them, put manganese in for cobalt. Now I'm going to rotate it by 45 degrees. Look what you got. Okay? And in place of calcium, we have sodium and potassium. I'm not showing you here. The sodium and potassium sit up here. So you can see this is almost a cube. If I put a sodium in front of the board here, you would have the cube. So this literally is the dimer of the oxygen evolving complex with cobalt instead of manganese. What is it and what's it doing? We can see that when it's sitting in just at a resting state, it's mostly cobalt too because we can do EPR. Then we turn the potential up, cobalt two goes away, and as we get into the catalytic cycle, we start to see this new signal. That new signal, we can go and make cubes synthetically in our lab. I'm an inorganic chemist. So my students have figured out how to make cobalt cubes, and we can take those molecules and then oxidize them up to cobalt four, and we get that EPR signal. And that EPR signal is a G sig, it's called G tensor 2.27 for a cobalt 4. So we know that once we get to cobalt 4, the catalyst has become active. So what's happening is in that cube, we're going from cobalt 2, then we oxidize it to 3, then to 4, and when we get to 4, we start seeing oxygen. Now, Here's an important lesson. A lot of scientists try, chemists try to make stable catalysts. We knew this catalyst couldn't be stable. And the reason it can't be stable is, and for the physicists in the group, you'll like this. This is the old beta crystal field theory. Okay, so I have electrons in T2G, and then what happens is at cobalt four, it's low spin, cobalt three, it's low spin. But once I go to a cobalt two ligand field, 
Electrons go into EG, and then the thing becomes unstable, and it loses its ligands, and it falls apart. So we knew this thing was going to fall apart. But remember, when I, get, I started out this problem by taking cobalt 2 to 3, and then the cluster self-assembled. So what that means is I have a repair mechanism. I can let the cluster fall apart. So here's the cluster. I have a potential on the cluster. It's operating. I turn the potential off. We make the cluster out of radioactive cobalt. It starts, you can see the radioactivity showing up in solution because I've reached the ligand field state, high spin state of cobalt too. It starts falling apart. I put a potential back on it. It reassembles off on. Okay. Why do I? Now what I have is a compound that's actually healing itself on the fly. And the reason why people hadn't been able to take known catalysts and just put them in, water, in a glass of water in simple engineered conditions, remember, all I care about is cost. I don't want complicated machinery. Because I had to work in concentrated base, because when you split water, you make acid, and acid hits the metal oxide, and it decomposes. It corrodes. So my thing's going to corrode, too, but now I have a way to self-heal it and keep having it fix itself. There's lots of bonuses to that. One bonus is, here's one of these commercial nickel oxide catalysts. You can see if I don't use pure water, this thing dies immediately. This catalyst, I said four months, it's been going over a year outside the Charles River. We just go and get water out of the Charles River and it works. Because I can't ever passivate it. I can't make biofilms and I can't make passivating hydroxies because I can actually just have the catalyst slough off the outer layer and then reform the catalyst, self-heal it. Okay. So that's the first advantage. I can use any water source. It also works out of salt water. You can go down to the Boston Harbor and get the salt water. It works. Um, how's the, what's the mechanism? I'll just start. I won't go into the details, but I can look to see as I turn up the potential, how much faster does the catalyst run? And if I take that slope, the slope of this, I get 64 millivolts. That's called Nernstein. It means I have a one electron pre-equilibrium, cobalt three to four. So I have to get to that cobalt four state in a pre-equilibrium. Then I have a rate determining step that leads to OO bond formation. This all sounds ped pedantic, and it sounds like I'm in the gore of details. This is the key I'm going to show you to building an artificial leaf. You have to control this slope right here, which is called the Tafel slope. Remember, this cobalt catalyst is 64 millivolts. If I add 64 millivolts of energy potential, it gets 10 times better for every 64 millivolts. I can also show you that it's inversely proportional to a proton. And that makes sense because if I have a cobalt-3 hydroxy, this is what's some, a field called proton-coupled ET. I have to get the proton off as I do the electron transfer. Okay. Here's the mechanism. We take cobalt 2,2 two to 3,3 three to 3,4. We did this with EPR. Then the state you were just looking at was the pre-equilibrium state to the active catalyst to get to the 4,4. Four. Then the OO bond forms. You make O2. If we get to cobalt 2 and some of it falls out, I have an over, a little extra potential of 200 millivolts to drive it back to cobalt 3. It reheals itself and it keeps on going. So this thing doesn't have a turnover number. Like some scientists talk about turnover number. How many turnovers before it dies? The turnover number is infinite because it never dies. Right? The real question is how fast does it work? Turnover frequency. That's the difference. This is what's new about self-healing. What, what's the real OO bond forming step? I'll just go through this quickly. Troy Van Voorhees at MIT, a theorist, and a student have looked at this. What they find out is when you get to that cobalt 4-4 state, you get a lot of spin density on the outside oxygens. They're oxyl radicals. Troy is one of the pioneers of constrained DFT, so he can get pretty good spin densities. And we see the OO bond forming here. 
And so we link that pre-equilibrium, one electron, one proton, to so get to the catalytically active cobalt-4-4 state. And then we see the two oxygens coming in. Can we test that theoretically? I'll just tell you we have, because I can make the catalyst out of a flavor of oxygen, 18, isotope O18. And then I can put it into O16 water. If the first, if all the oxygen coming off is 36, then the oxygens have to be coming from the core. We see no 36 labeled O2. We see a little bit of 34 O2, meaning one oxygen came from the core and one came from an oxygen from water. But most of it comes from the terminal oxygens. But we think there's a minor pathway of an edge bridging, even though Troy thinks most of it is this. He's probably right. But at any rate, that calculation looks pretty good. So here's the first piece of it. We have an oxygen evolving complex that looks a lot like what's in the leaf, even structurally. It repairs itself. If you oxidize manganese two to three, this self-assembles. If we oxidize cobalt two to three, this self-assembles. And because of the repair mechanism, I didn't tell you about photosynthesis, photosynthesis has a repair mechanism. When it splits water, the O2 is so deadly to the plant, it starts corroding the plant. So what the plant does is it has a protein that holds the cluster in place, it removes it, it's called the D1 protein. It then rebuilds the D1 protein from a cysteine, reinserts it, the manganese reforms, and it starts up again. So that's how the plant does it. Because of that, it can operate in regular, benign, con simple conditions. Right? You don't see plants highly engineered to do uh, photosynthesis. And we can literally just operate out of a glass of water. You saw the oxygen being made literally out of an open glass of water, that movie. Now, what I didn't tell you is when the protons are left behind, I wasn't showing you where we were making hydrogen. We were making hydrogen at a platinum electrode. But remember, I'm in a glass of water, so I don't have to use platinum. Fuel cell people do, they're in highly acidic conditions, but I'm in water. And so can I get rid of the platinum? That's actually pretty easy. With the three metal alloy, and I'll just show it to you here, nickel, molybdenum, and a soft metal. So what's that, cadmium or zinc? For the chemists in the group and material scientists, you can't take nickel and put it in phosphate or borate, because what happens is the phosphate and borate bind the surface passivate it, protons can't get in to do hydrogen. So what we did is we have nickel molybdenum, which is a good alloy for making hydrogen if you don't have any anions around. But I need the phosphate and the borate to keep self-assembling the cluster. So we throw a soft metal in there, it's highly polarizable, and it shifts the equilibrium of phosphate and borate off the surface. So now phosphate and borate can't stick to the surface. The nickel can do the heavy lifting for making hydrogen, and it's a champ. At 35 millivolt over potential, I can hit 1,000 milliamps per centimeter squared, meaning this thing can really churn out hydrogen, and it's cheap. Okay. So here's a box that you can go on the web. I told you you can buy these commercial electrolyzers. You can buy an electrolyzer that works in base. It's expensive. If you work in water, then you, can, you need catalysts that don't decompose in water, and that's usually alloys of platinum, rhodium, and iridium. Okay? And you need expensive membranes, napion. So you can buy this thing at around 12K. They're even down to 8K right now, and they work at one kilowatt. So that's our beaker experiment, 2008. We're now at 2011. This thing costs $22 to build, and it's operating 10 times slower. So if you want to make a lot of hydrogen per unit time, go buy this. But if you don't need to make a lot of hydrogen per unit time, so I've dropped a factor of 10 in efficiency, so I'm at 100 watts versus a kilowatt, I can build you a box now for 22 bucks. And that's being built for 22 bucks. So that's a big cost reduction. So you should be happy about that. But then what happens? I'm still using this, the solar photovoltaic. So the way this thing works is I take the solar photovoltaic, I wire it 
now to this box that's cheap. But for poor people, I still have to go and buy a photovoltaic, and those things can be expensive. The thing about the photovoltaic is most of the cost has little to do with the single crystal silicon. Okay? Most of it has to do with the packaging. The commodities cost, the, the cost of the wiring, the single crystal silicon, is 13% of the install cost of the PV. Here's all the other breakout. So the silicon itself can be as low in, in what some of the stuff China's producing now. Single crystal can be as low as 4 to 5% of the total cost of the photovoltaic. So can I get rid of all this extra cost? And that starts driving you now to this leaf, because if I could integrate my catalyst directly to the single crystal silicon, just like I showed you at the beginning of this talk, use light to do the wireless current in silicon, and then collect the charge with the catalyst integrated, then I can just directly go from single crystal silicon, thin films of my catalyst, drop this thing in a glass of water, and do water splitting. So that's what we tried to do. Now, silicon itself doesn't have enough potential to split water. You need 1.3 volts. To run it fast enough, you need to be around 1.5. Silicon only has 0.6 volts. So if I'm going to just use what's called single junction silicon, one, one junction of silicon, I only get 0.6 volts, so I'm going to have to put extra voltage into the system. I'll have to wire it. But we were willing to do that just to see, could we actually do an integrated design of catalyst to silicon? So Yup is a physicist in my group, a postdoc. And so this is what he did, is he took silicon. There's boron doped silicon. That's why it's PSI. Then over here, oh, I'm supposed to be standing over here for the filming, sorry. Um, here we put on phosphorus. Okay, and that makes N, and now you have an NP header junction. So that's the single junction to separate the charge. And then this is done in the silicon community. You can put aluminum in here and make a P plus. It, it makes the tunneling barrier much sharper. I'll show you. This is just to make a good piece of silicon. So with the P plus, you make a very sharp curve here to get the hole and out of the silicon. And the bottom line is, the open. this is just doing silicon. This is nothing special. Uh, you, it has an open circuit vent voltage of 0.57 volts. I told you you would get around 6 volts out of a single junction. And then at open circuit, you can get around 27 milliamps per centimeter squared. Remember, what I showed you, that electrolyzer works at 100 milliamps per centimeter squared. And this is typical. The current density you get out of silicon is around 30 milliamps. So you don't need to be at a 1,000 a milliamps per centimeter squared. That's overkill. All right, so that's what the silicon's doing. Now, remember, when you make O2 from water, O2 plus silicon will make SiO2 sand. So what we did, Buke did, is he sputtered ITO, indium tin oxide, actually in the paper that will be coming out in science we have fluorinated tin oxide, which is cheaper, and it's even better than ITO. It's a conducting oxide, so we now passivate the silicon, protect it, and any hole we make can get through the oxide layer. I have to put a voltage on a single junction, so we just put on some metal contacts and we protect them. And now what I, we do is we then either put a voltage on the silicon, and we run this like an electrode, and when we come from cobalt two to three, we can make our thin film of cobalt. And so this is what you see. Just looking at it with no light on the silicon, and I scan the silicon like an electrode, at 1.3 volts, we start doing water oxidation. So this is just like the electrode I showed you high, wired to the photovoltaic. It's just an electrode. But remember, this is on silicon, a single junction. So if I now turn the light on, I should get 0.6 volts out of the single junction of silicon. And you can see that perfectly happens. I get 0.52 volts. And depending on, no matter how hard, remember, I can drive this with an external voltage. No matter what over voltage I choose, I'm always perfectly 0.52 volts offset.
meaning the silicon is working just like I hoped. I'm shining light on it. I'm making an energized wireless current, 0.6 volts worth, that I can use, and now I don't have to use that much applied voltage. I'm minus 0.52 volts. That's good. Every bit of it's making oxygen. We can analyze that with mass spectroscopy. If I were to take this then and wire it to another cell, so I now wire two of them, now I have 0.52 volts plus 0.52 volts. So before I was at 1.3, I drop 0.52, I should drop another 0.52. So that happens. Now I only need 0.3 volts of applied potential. So everything's working really nicely, but this is all wired. Can I add a third cell? I would like to do that. I don't want to put any voltage on it, because now I have to carry around a volt, something to put voltage on, and I have to wire it. That costs money. I don't want to do that. So no wires. But I still want to operate out of the Charles River, a puddle of water. Okay? So this is what you do. We took silicon, this is commercial, take amorphous silicon. So this is actually a commercial silicon amorphous cell in its triple junction. And what happens effectively is these three are wired together in what's called a tunnel junction, Berry junction. And when you have silicon, that, the amorphous silicon absorbs up here. When I put germanium in it, it absorbs here. When I put some more germanium in it, it absorbs there. And that's the solar spectrum now. So I'm, this is the spectrum, rather, of the cell. And that's covering the, the solar spectrum really nicely. Remember, I'm going to need three photons to generate my current, because I'm absorbing up here, here, and here. That means I'm going to have a decrease in my overall efficiency, because I need three photons per electron hole. But this is all you need to worry about for the experts in the audience. I'm mentioning that. All you have to worry about is what's the real efficiency of the cell. That's where the three photons come in. And this cell is a 7.7% cell. So overall, light in to wire electrical current, wireless current, it's 7.7% energy conversion. Light in to, to uh, energy out. And it operates at 1.7 volts, so it has plenty of energy to do water splitting. And I can get 8 milliamps per centimeter squared out of this. Right, so this is a typical amorphous cell. So what I'm showing here is, let's just do the first experiment. I'll put my amorphous silicon cell on the back of a stainless steel plate. I'll grow my, I'll sputter my ITO layer. I'll put my cobalt catalyst here. And then I'll just wire it to my nickel molybdenum zinc catalyst. Okay. And if you do that, and now I shine light on this, there's no external voltage applied on this, you can see that this thing's real. If I put it in base, it dies right away. This is known all the time. Silicon is really unstable in base. But I'm in a glass of water with my ITO coating. And you can see I'm hitting a 5% solar to fuels efficiency. So what that means is for light coming in, my overall efficiency, light in to hydrogen out, is 5%. Remember, I only have around an 8% cell to drive it. So I'm collecting 60% of the wireless current out of the cell to make hydrogen, which is pretty good. So this is a real efficiency. Light in, and then you measure how much hydrogen comes out and oxygen come out. But this is still wired. I'm still engineering this. Can I just go to a spray thing where I take the amorphous silicon, spray ITO on it, then spray my nickel molybdenum zinc on it, and then electro a photo deposit my cobalt on it? So here we go. I do that. And now I just have a wafer of silicon, protective coating, catalyst, and the other cap. So now when light comes into here, the electron will go this way. That's where I have my N, I have this junction. Electron goes this way, hole goes this way. Should I split water? And so, here, just give me one second because of the Jimmy Stewart movie. Okay, here. 
So what you're about to see here is, here's just the way for sitting. Okay, wait. I just want to start from the beginning. So here's a wafer. It's just sitting in an open glass of water, just the way I told you I designed it. Sunlight just comes on. So this is AM 1.5 solar, solar simulator. Now, this is where the cobalt catalyst is on the front face. You can see the oxygen. It's kind of hard to see the hydrogen. I'll show you in a minute, right? So this thing really is doing what I wanted to promise you, it really is an artificial leak. There's no wires. You take this, go to the Charles River, drop it in, and that's what you get. Okay? And this thing is, op this cell itself is operating at 3% efficiency because I have ohmic drop because the protons have to run around to the back side. So what you had just seen on the front side is the oxygen being made. Here, so you have the oxygen being made right here, and then there are protons being made on the front face that have to run around to the back. So this isn't an engineered cell, right? I'm gonna have to engineer the cell to get my 60% efficiency. But for the O2 coming out this side, I'm making twice the amount of hydrogen on that side. No external voltage, no nothing, just sunlight. And you can literally do this. You take these leaves, put them in a, a a glass of water, just walk outside, hold it up to sunlight, or put them on the windowsill, and they go like this. Okay? And that's using sunlight. So there's the solar simulator. To end, I just want to mention a lot of this discussion in the solar field and solar to fuel. So this is called direct solar to fuels. And by the way, if you use a 20% silicon cell, I'll give you 12% direct hydrogen to, and oxygen. So DOE target's six. We can blow over that with a 10% PV cell. So we're building those in our labs now. Um, if you put I, FTO down on the silicon, we've had over 35 hours, no drop in activity. Um, so it really depends on how good a job you make your protecting oxide layer. But I just want to mention, this is literally the PV curve we have right now that I just showed you before of the silicon. And then remember I told you that taffle slope of how my catalyst operates? The taffle slope was 64. It's, it should, this this is, should be 64. So here is my catalyst turning on with voltage and then current density. And here is my current density and my PV, and they need to match to make a good artificial leaf. Now, what happens is most PVs we use in the community are oxides, so they come way out here. So you just keep drawing this line out here. You can have a crappy or junky crap catalyst. You never see it because it's always intersecting the top of the curve because this PV curve comes way out here. But point in fact, if you want to be at the, thermo, the highest efficiency, you want to be at the thermodynamic limit of water splitting. So in the cell I'm showing you, I'm up at 8%, but this thing is running out here, that amorphous silicon cell. What happens if I just do the thought experiment and say I can start engineering silicon to move it to near the thermodynamic potential? I'm only going to move it over a little. I'll just move it from there to there. But with that taffle slope with the cobalt catalyst, look what happened. That's real data. This is real data. That's real data. This is a thought experiment. I lose all my photosynthesis. So this isn't an issue with how building a photovoltaic material. This is an issue of catalysis. What I need to do is make the slope come up much tighter and faster. And so I won't go into this, but we went to nickel, partly because of Jim Muckerman's work, where it should be more basic. So we've gone and made a nickel catalyst like this. It's a bigger disk. All our PDF work over across the street here tells us it's a bigger disk, but it's the same type of structure. But because it's more basic, it holds on to its protons. What that does is it's not a one electron pre-equilibrium, it's a two electron pre-equilibrium. And I don't want to go into all the electrochemistry, but you put a two instead of a one, and when you take the over potential as a function of current, this will flip over, 
then you get a half in the denominator of Nernstein behavior. So when you're Nernstein behavior, you're 60 millivolts. If two ends up in the denominator, which is this is how we designed this catalyst, we wanted a two electron step, that means my slope should be 30 millivolts. And point in fact, when we haven't published any of this yet, but when you take this nickel catalyst now, I go from 62 millivolts with cobalt to 29 millivolts with nickel. Now, why is that good? Because now, when I get my silicon right, look what, what happened. This, this is literally now the TAFL data of the nickel catalyst and cobalt. If you look at the self-exchange potential, where the catalyst turns on, they both turn on at the exact same spot. But because nickel's slope is higher, it comes it rises faster and it turns on quicker. And now I'm back up to near the top of my curve for the silicon. So this isn't something that the community's grappled with yet because they haven't, they've been mostly focused on the PV and not the catalysis. But now we're so close with this artificial leaf, I'm still throwing away some energy. I would like to move this here, but you really do pay a big price in efficiency. But with this nickel catalyst, which will be appearing, we really have the TAFL slope or activity slope of the catalyst matched to the PV, which is an important issue. And so I'm just showing you this is a harbinger, and it really says you just can't be doing PV stuff. You really have to do catalyst design properly if you're going to get this artificial leaf to really hum. So what's all this telling you is I call this fast food energy because now we're at just single crystal silicon or amorphous silicon and really cheap materials. You can just do the spray on high throughput manufacturing and it's light, okay? So we're really moving here. Um, I call this fast food energy. This guy uh, is my partner in crime now. His name's Ratan Tata from India and he's, really helping me because his family's helped build the entire industrial complex of India. Okay, so Mr. Tata, if people if you ever go to India, Tata Motors, Tata Power, Tata Steel, Tata. He owns Jaguar, and by the way, he bought half of BP Solar, so you guys are dealing with him. You just, if you realize it or not, he might buy the whole thing for all I know. Okay, but the really cool thing, which you can't see down here, is he talks about new products and science designed to appeal to poor people in the rising middle class. Why is he saying that? Because in the next 15 years, 350 million people will rise from what you would call poverty into India and start rising into the middle class, which is the entire population of the United States just in India. So there's your market. The people are poor, so you have to have a different strategy than America. What's destroyed America is return on investment on quarterly earnings for those people 60 miles away. I will tell you what Mr. Tata told me. He goes, no, sir, do you know what you get with me? And it's not the obvious question or answer, lots of money, right? Because he owns a huge conglomerate. He said patience. And he told me one little story. When his family started Power Tata Steel, it was in 1930, with a 70-year return on investment. Because he was trying to build a company to employ Indians, because the English were there, and there was a lot of racism. And so what he was trying to do was give the Indian people his family self-worth. So the whole goal of Tata Steel, when it started in 1930, was to employ Indians. Okay? When I was with Mr. Tata once, he said, after telling me that, he said it was a 70-year return on investment. He said, guess what Tata Steel was worth in 2000 with a big smile on his face? $35 billion, okay? So that's why you gotta, you gotta attack this problem in a different way. Again, I don't think our society's set up for that because we have stockholders who want a three-month return on their investment. If you go to the poor, you need a long-term vision. And there are people like that. He's one of them. And so uh, just watch and see what happens. But it's now all him, little to do with me. And we'll see what happens in the next few years. So thanks a lot.
speaker. Now we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. You are too close to me. Come over here. Yeah, that, that's a big effect. We're not, there's two things I didn't talk about. One is that catalyst absorbs some light. It's only 100 nanometers. So we're losing 7% of the light in absorption. That can be engineered around. There are things called throughputs that you can do in PV manufacturing. But the other is bubbles. And we aren't controlling that. But this is out of my lab. There's this company, Sun Catalytics, that is set up. Um, and they're driving all this technology, and they have lots of engineers, and they have the bubble issue under control. That bubble issue has been dealt with a lot, even in the chloroalkali industry for the last hundred years. So when you finally get to engineering a device, you need to deal with the bubble issue, because not, not only is it messing up the light coming in, but you're actually taking out a lot of the surface area of the material. So there are ways to keep the bubbles really tiny and then not have them adhere. And I just actually chose that movie because they were the biggest bubbles, so you could see it. It looked more impressive, didn't it? But it's the worst engineering design. Thank you. Somebody else? Yeah. So you're exactly right. If I, if I wasn't... So the first thing is I have the phosphate in there, right, to take the proton. But in these measurements, if you start getting to massively high current density, where the phosphate can't keep up with the proton, or you're not managing the flow, which is what we need to do when we start getting to really high current densities, you'll start seeing the pH show up and affect the TAFL data. So that TAFL data is all run at 20, 20 milliamps or lower. When we get below, above 20 milliamps with no, with no management of the solution, you start having a terrible time with protons. Um, to keep taking your question one step further, on the leaf, it's a really, again, bad design. You're really looking at the first pieces of this, but you really don't want protons running from the middle all the way around because, again, you're going to have these pH effects. So there are things being done like engineering the silicon with just holes in it. The real interesting thing there, if you looked, I have no membrane. That's another big cost. That's membraneless cell. So I don't want a membrane. It costs lots of money. And why am I able to get away with it? Because hydrogen and oxygen have low solubilities in water. And then the other thing is my cobalt catalyst doesn't touch the hydrogen or protons. So you get selectivity with the catalyst. So that allows me to run this thing, like I showed you, just this thing sitting in a glass of water. But to deal with the pH issue, if you're going to start getting to high throughputs, you're going to have to actually not want, you don't want the protons running around, and you probably just want them going right from one side to the other side through the silica. So all that stuff is being engineered. I just don't have any patience for it because I'm a lowly chemist. But I have a lot of engineering friends who are knocking the heck out of the problem. One question there. Yeah, yeah, good. So in that leaf, hydrogen's being made on this side and oxygen's made on this side, so we just have a separator on top. Now, Steve Chu, this is called direct, right? And then there's the indirect method. Take sunlight and then put it into an electrolyzer and wires. The sort of folklore in the community right now is direct should be really cheap because I just took out all the cost of the wiring and blah, blah, blah. But what I didn't tell you, and you can, you can start thinking about this as an engineer, I got to collect the hydrogen off both. I'm doing chemistry over the, the surface area of my device, while before I was only in, indirect, I'm only collecting photons over the surface area, and I'm doing chemistry in a small box, which I can actually come up to pressure. 
In this device, I'm collecting hydrogen and oxygen on each side. I've got to collect them and pressurize them. So I am absolutely not in the camp of the DOE right now, and they just spent a lot of money for doing direct solar to fuels. I believe this will be of value to the DOE because I can now do a hard techno-economic analysis side by side using the same silicon, same catalyst to make so much hydrogen per unit time and actually do a cost modeling. So this leaf, the hydrogen and oxygen separated, but there's a lot of technical engineering things that aren't being addressed yet because you're literally looking at the first stages of this. And I'm not convinced that Steve Chu's right about direct solar to fuels, to be frank. We'll see. The cheaper thing to do, which EERE has done a cost analysis, is to put these as particles. This is going to get to where you were going. And then you make the hydrogen and oxygen in one container. You get a much higher surface area, and then you just have to, you have an explosive mixture. You've got to be careful about that. And you've got to separate the hydrogen and oxygen. But that should be relatively cheap because we do a lot of nitrogen out of oxygen. Getting oxygen out of hydrogen is easier. But if you look at DOE, EERE -E modeling, they really say you want to bring this to particles. And this is the advantage of no wires. You can imagine this going quickly to just silicon nano rods. People know how to do triple junction, coat them with ITO, put the catalyst on there, and throw them into solution. So now you don't have a leaf. You have an artificial algae, which is high surface area. So there's still a lot of places to go with this research. I'll driving at your issue of cost and modeling and all these practical things of hydrogen, oxygen, and separate. But we're working on that. One last question. Yeah. How many leaves would it take to electrolyze the chemical? Oh, my God. I don't know. Could I do a different calculation for you? OK. If I took, so. I told you I wanted 100 watts, so why, I want 100 watts an hour. Why do I want 100 watts an hour? You guys use around 30 kilowatt hours a day, one and a half watts. Europe is one, 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 one kilowatt an hour. They're 24 kilowatt hours. If I could go to the poor at 100 watts, I could make them one-tenth the energy use. And remember, GDP scales with energy. So I could get them in the ball game. The other thing is then they have money and they can educate. And when education starts, birth rates drop, which helps my horse manure problem. So I'm totally focused on 100 watts. So now let's do that. 100 watts of splitting th that bottle of water and that much water a day. And for just an average solar insulation of 220, I need the size of a leaf that's the size of a door. So that's how I'm really thinking is, and, and then once you have that bottle of water, you're good to go because once you make the hydrogen and oxygen, you recombine it. My problem now is the fuel cell's too expensive, but they've all been over-designed for cars not to just bleed out this much high. So I, if people would start working on fuel cells from the ground up for cost and not efficiency, I don't think they'll be that expensive. But in the meantime, I can't wait. So we're thinking of using turbines. And then a company Mr. Tata has is Jaguar. And they've actually already made little turbines that burn hydrogen directly, but they haven't implemented them. So we might, you just can't wait right now. So I'm just going to have to live with that. But um, once you have the hydrogen, you can do other things. But just, just think about this. Every time you drink a bottle of water, you could save a poor family. <laughs>